Okay, we're gonna, um, we'll get started. Um, thanks everybody for joining. There may be a few uh, jumping in as, as we go. So um, we'll, uh, we'll let people catch up as we, as we jump into it. So welcome everybody to our iNaturalist uh, CSI, Canadian Species, Species Identification um, webinar series. This is the, the fifth one we've had this summer um, and the final one for the, for the season and uh, just fitting for the, the fall migration period coming up. Um, so the, this one obviously is targeted at uh, identifying um, birds. Um, this webinar and others will be, they, have, they are being recorded. Um, they can be found on CWF's website. Uh, the best place, and I'll drop this into the chat in a little bit, but the best way to find these, if you, um, if you Google CWF webinars, um, you'll be able to find our, our landing page, which has, we'll have this recording and, and a bunch of others about iNaturalist and other things as well. Um, so I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging with immense gratitude that the land on which I live, work, and play is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, I am James Page, Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, among other things, I've been the lead in the, um, the kind of creation and um, managing of iNaturalist here in Canada. And we are privileged to have Kyle Blaney joining us. Um, he's an avid bird watcher and an amazing photographer. Uh, his images have been published in Canadian Ge Geographic um, and birding magazines in both Canada and the US. Um, Kyle is also a really huge contributor to um, community science, uh, having contributed thousands of observations both to iNaturalist and to eBird. Uh, he's also a data anal analyst for Ashad Canada, which is a nonprofit that provides uh, unique youth uh, experiences. So um, just quickly, Zoom logistics, um, where the chat is only going to be available for um, Kyle and I will be able to see, but reserve this please just for um, technical questions, and I'll, I'll try and get back to you uh, as we go. Um, if all else fails, uh, or for some reason we get cut off, um, say I get a random power failure, which has happened once, um, just just rejoin using that same link that you've had. Um, so yeah, and if, if something's kind of glitching, um, if you can't figure it out, just leaving and rejoining will often fix the problem. Um, we're going to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, so you can write those in. And please feel free to write them in as we go while they're refreshing your mind. Um, and then I'll compile them and uh, pose them to Kyle uh, at the end. And for those who are hearing impaired, you wouldn't be hearing this, but there is an option for the live transcription at the bottom of the screen. So you can tap that to show the um, live transcription. So first of all, uh, CWF is one of Canada's uh, largest conservation organization um, undertaking conservation projects across the country and, and some kind of key areas of focus. You can see that just kind of uh, mentioned up here. Um, our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats. Um, CWF is also the lead in the creation and uh, management of iNaturalist Canada, along with our, our very, our, um, esteemed partners at the uh, Royal Ontario Museum, Parks Canada, and NatureServe Canada. Um, in Canada, we are a part of uh, a global network of 19 countries, and a few more are in the works, actually, that each have their own branch, their own version of iNaturalist, just like we do here in Canada. Um, so it's a pretty global phenomenon, and these all feed into the global iNaturalist.org database, which is run by the uh, California Academy of Sciences in partnership with National Geographic. Um, there's about 140 million observations globally. Um, nine million of these, a little over nine, uh, are from here in Canada. Uh, so we have a large database, uh, which is searchable um, and can be downloadable. Um, and so uh, our database in Canada, um, we're, we're requesting or um, seeing for people to um, take part in the Canadian version in particular, because it allows us to share data more easily for conservation research here in Canada. It's also bilingual and we have some, some resources specific that we've designed here as well. Um, this database can be filtered, um, just showing the uh, 1.2 million bird observations we have here in Canada, um, the, the top bird observations we can see here. Uh, and um, basically the, the kind of the, the bottom line um, for taking part in iNaturalist is that you don't need to be an, an, an expert to contribute to conservation. Uh, basically, if you can take a picture, you can contribute. 
we have a really um, simple to use app, which um, rec automatically records the date and location. We have the uh, website, which allows you to <clears throat> drag and drop photos. And both of these incorporate image recognition software uh, to help identify what it is you observed or we took a picture of. Uh, and there's a community of over 250,000 people that are helping to identify observations. Um, so something to bear in mind is that the better your photo, uh, which Kyle will help us out with, with birds, um, the better the chances of your observation being identified by others as well. And we have some resources that are uh, out there to help people um, uh, kind of key in on some of these features. And these are available in the help section of inaturalist.ca. And with that, I will turn it over to Kyle to talk about photographing birds. Thank you, James. Let me just get my presentation started. And now I'll share my screen. And can you just give me a thumbs up that you can see that? Yeah, we got it. Okay, Thanks. great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be talking about what has become my most passionate hobby. It's what I really spend a lot of my time doing and thinking about how I can do it more. Um, all the photos in this presentation are taken by me. We'll get in later on as to some of the tips that I can provide to how you can get similar types of photos. A little bit about how passionate I am about birding. I have a goal to see 50 species in every eBird region of Canada. There are 290 regions in Canada, according to eBird. And for example, here's what my eBird map of British Columbia looks like. You can see that it has all the different regions with the redness of a region indicating how many species I've observed in that region. And this map is something that I can use to plan my next trip to BC because there's one notable region in here, the central coast region of BC, that is not red enough in my humble opinion. I have not seen enough species in the central coast region. I'd love to get to do that in 2023. My next trip to BC will include a trip to Bella Coola so that I'm able to increase the number of species I've seen in that region. I want to have this map as red as possible for every province of Canada, but it's really just an excuse to help me see the great diversity that we have in our country. I go birding every day. Uh, one of the statistics I'm most concerned with is my eBird streak, which tells me how many days in a row I've birded. And I want that to go for many thousands of more days. Before I get into how you can learn about birds, I wanted to mention some of the apps that I use while I'm birding and to help me plan my birding trips. I recognize that for some people, birding is something where they want to get as far away from technology as possible. And I respect that. I understand how nice it is to be out in nature without any kind of technology near you. But my background is technical. I consider it a privilege that I get to use these apps while I'm birding. And I get to see how the artificial intelligence, for example, of iNaturalist's image identification combines with some of my favorite hobbies. I've already mentioned that I use the eBird app. That's to record my checklist in the field. I can also use it to help me plan the next stop if I'm out for a day of birding. I have iNaturalist ready to go at all times. In the field, I usually use it to identify things that are not moving. Lately, I've become quite interested in fungus and slime mold, which don't fly away as much as birds do. When I'm birding, I use the Merlin Bird ID app all the time. It's what lets you identify the sounds of birds in real time as you're out in the field. And like any tool, it's just one piece of input for you to help you decide what birds you've observed. In my case, I like to use it to confirm that I am hearing what I think I'm hearing. And it can also detect birds and help me learn 
the sounds of birds that I otherwise might not know. I use bird's eye, which is connected to my eBird uh, account and is another tool that can help me plan my trips. I use two field guides in the field, the Sibley Guide and iBird Pro. Sibley has a feature that lets you look at two species side by side. And though, so let, to let you distinguish between similar species. And then I use the Warbler Guide, which is a more of a modern kind of app to, tailored to a very specific type of bird, the warblers. And with it, you can see 3D models of two species and manipulate those models to match the view of the bird that you had. For example, if you see a bird from directly from underneath, as you might for warblers that are, at, that are often in the tops of trees, you can manipulate the 3D model so it spins the bird around so that you can only see what the bird would look like from underneath. I think that's a really cool use of combining technology with my favorite hobby. The most important thing you want to do to become a birder is become familiar with the families of birds there are, which is the taxonomy. You wanna understand that there are different types of birds and what they are. That's the first step before you get involved in distinguishing within that family, what species of bird have I seen? Even if you're really, really new to birding and haven't ever formally done any bird watching, you know more about the taxonomy of birds than you might think. I'm sure that you could tell the difference between, for example, a pigeon and a cardinal. They're quite differently colored, they behave differently, they sound different, and they are different types of birds. You can also tell the difference between, I'm sure, an owl and a pelican. A pelican is more likely to be in the water. You're more likely to see an owl in dawn or dusk or hear it at night. You're probably not gonna see an owl swimming in the water, although there are YouTube videos of such things. They're birds, they're uh, not always doing what they're supposed to be doing. Once you learn what the families are, and you do that by browsing a bird book, I recommend getting a bird book and just, if you're new, reading it, uh, leafing through the pages over and over and over again. That's what I would have done with my, my family when I was little, and it's a great way to start. Once you get familiar with the families, you can then start to learn in more detail what the common species look like and, and what they sound like. For example, in most of Canada, the most common chickadee is a black-capped chickadee, and therefore you should really get familiar with what they look like, what they sound like, how they act. That way, when you encounter one that's a little bit different, maybe you're up in the boreal forest and you see a chickadee that has a brown cap instead of a black cap. And then you might have discovered that you saw a boreal chickadee and not a black cap chickadee. If you're in the mountains and you hear something that's quite like a black cap chickadee, but sounds a little bit different, maybe you've encountered a mountain chickadee. And if you're in the West, maybe you're lucky and have encountered a chestnut back chickadee. That's part of learning the possibilities of what you can see. Gulls are something that occur across the country. You want to become familiar with the, the common gulls. Ring-billed gull is a very common gull, often seen in fields and parking lots and things like that, as well as near the water. So you want to know what, they, what their bills look like, what their legs look like, what their wings look like what they look like at, at various ages, get used to approximately how big they are, that type of thing. And you also don't want to forget about some of the common birds that are really extraordinarily beautiful, but overlooked because of how common they are. I think robin is a good example of that. It's a very beautiful bird. If it showed up in other parts of the world, they'd really be marveling at how this awesome looking red breasted bird has appeared. And so you want to get used to seeing that as the most common thrush that you would encounter in most of the country. Bird watchers tend to use the shape of birds a lot to help distinguish them. And that can mean the shape in terms of how the bird flies. For example, turkey vultures fly with a very strong 
V shape to their wings called a dihedral. And then other birds have uniquely shape, unique shapes elsewhere. For example, the canvas back duck has a very strong ski slope face. You, can, you could really take off if you were to go down that thing and re really launch yourself a far way. It's almost like it has no, its forehead is at such an extreme angle that it's something you can recognize from a great distance in addition to the contrast of the darkness of the head and the lightness of the back. Other birds have such unique characteristics that you will definitely never forget them once you, once you become aware of them. A crossbill is a good example of that. As this bird's name suggests, its bill is cross. And that's an adaptation that it has to eat what it needs to eat. And unfortunately, not all birds are as well named as the crossbill, but just an example of how the shape of a very specific part of a bird can help you tell exactly what it is. As you become a bit more experienced as a birder, you'll get to know the more subtle shapes that exist. And I'm using this grasshopper sparrow as an example of a bird that has a very flat head. I think that this particular individual looks like it was hit on the head with maybe a shovel or something. But uh, once you get familiar with that, what that looks like, it gets etched in your brain the more and more you see it. So that, again, you can start to distinguish these birds at a quick glance as opposed to while studying a photograph. I also want to mention that I'd mentioned size when it comes to gulls, but you definitely need to be careful using size as your primary source of species identification. It's not always the case that you'll see a small bird right beside another bird of a different size. For example, this is a little gull beside a larger ring-billed gull. It's easy to tell in this picture why the little gull has the name that it does. It's little, even compared to what is normally our little gull. A, a ring-billed gull beside a great blackback gull looks little, but little gulls are truly little. They're small. But you more often are going to encounter birds close to other birds of similar sizes, moving around, flying. It's hard to tell the size apart in situations like that. For example, here's a flock that includes a little gull, but in this case, it's closer to more similarly sized Bonaparte's gulls and therefore harder to tell apart strictly based on size. And you can tell it apart based on other things like the color of its head and how its wings are patterned, things like that. But be wary of using size as your sole identification technique. You definitely need to become familiar with the seasonality of birds. I've written here that some birds only occur during the summer. What I really mean is nesting season, which for most birds is from spring until fall. But there are maps in any field guide that have colors on them, and you need to learn what those colors mean. There are colors that indicate when a bird is there in the nesting season only, the winter only, only during migration. Some birds have different migration routes in the spring and fall. So depending on where you are, you're more likely to see them in the spring when they're on their way north than in the fall when they're on their way south. As an example of seasonality, where I am in central Ontario, you're not going to see a loon in February. On an, the inland lakes are mostly frozen. There's no water for them. They generally migrate south and are only are not going to be seen in the winter. Similar for other birds like herons, they need open water. So they're not going to stick around while the majority of stuff is frozen. Other birds use where you are as the southern part of their range and therefore you only see them in the winter months. An example of a bird like that where I am is an American tree sparrow. This is a bird I'm unlikely to see in July, but I'm quite likely to see it in January, February. 
when it comes down to, to my part of Canada in the winter. And then there are other birds that just stick around all the time. Owls are often like that. Um, an evening grosbeak, you could encounter one any time. I happen to have seen one of these last week at Petroglyphs Provincial Park in Ontario. I think it's one of the furthest south places in Ontario I've seen one lately, other than Prince Edward County. That's a, just a bit of an aside. But birds like that are not as seasonal as the ones that would migrate in the spring and the fall. You also want to pay attention to how the bird is interacting with its environment. What habitat is it in? As an example, birds close to the shore are often shorebirds. You might see a sanderling walking along the shore, running in and out of the surf, making sure that it doesn't get hit with the waves. You're not as likely to see a warbler acting that way. But you can see birds outside their normal habitat. It's really more a rule of thumb that birds will go where they need to go to, to eat and to stay alive. But just keep in mind that on the shore, shorebirds are probably more common. You also want to pay attention to how the bird is behaving. What is it doing? Is it like a sanderling I mentioned, a sanderling that likes to run a, run close to the waves and then run back and then run out and then run back. And if you watch all kinds of different birds, you'll come up with your own ways of thinking about how they act. If you encounter a bird that's soaring, it's quite likely to be say a turkey vulture, like I showed you before with its V-shaped wings. You could also see a hawk that's soaring around. You're not likely to see warblers that are out there soaring in the sky. I'm not even sure if they're biologically capable of doing that, given how they're structured. If you see a bird that's plunging into the water, if you're at an inland location, you might be seeing, say, a Caspian tern or a common tern or some other kind of tern or a, a kingfisher that's plunging into the water. If you're out watching birds plunge into the water and you're on the open ocean, you're more likely to be seeing something like a gannet, which you're not going to see on a marsh, say. You also need to become familiar with a large number of terms that are used in bird watching to talk about the different parts of a bird. There's specific terminology related to the field marks that a bird has. And I wanted to use one example of how you can use one type of field mark to identify different species that are closely related. In this case, we're going to use a breast band, the presence and absence and number of and thickness of breast bands to help us identify plovers. For example, a killdeer has two quite thick and quite dark bands, breast bands. That's what one way you can identify sometimes from a great distance while you're using a spotting scope you can tell that something is a killdeer because of those bands. Related to a killdeer, but with only one band and a thinner band, is a semi-palmated plover. And related to that is a piping plover. So you might always be on the lookout for the piping plovers, which are much rarer. And that's why this one has a, a tag on its leg. It has a broken single breast band. Another good way, to identify piping plovers as indicated in this photo is to look for birds that have leg tags that unfortunately the piping plovers are so unusual that you can often identify the piping plover to an individual bird. In this case, this is the Sydney Crosby of piping plovers, number 87, which I encountered in Newfoundland. As an aside, it's also a good way to distinguish between trumpeter swans and tundra swans. At least where I am, if you see a swan with a yellow wing tag, it's almost definitely a trumpeter swan. In this case, you can get to see that this is not just any trumpeter swan, but trumpeter swan K29 that we hope's return to the Wellington Harbor in the near future. Other field marks that help you identify birds as an example, eye rings, Solitary sandpipers have quite a pronounced eye ring, a really noticeable 
white around the, the dark eye, the similar lesser yellow leg has a bit of an eye ring, but not quite as pronounced. That's one way you can tell them apart. You can also use the legs in this case, as the name suggests, a yellow legs as yellow legs. And you could have called the solitary sandpiper a solitary greenish yellow legs. It's not quite as yellow, even though they're somewhat yellow. The key to birding is to start using all of these different techniques and combine into an ID if your goal is to identify the birds that you see to species. Warblers are a good example of when you often need multiple field marks to tell them apart. For example, this is a fall black pole warbler. And in fact, there is one feature of this bird that does uniquely identify it, uh, that makes the yellow legs of this bird are a distinctive feature that can tell you right away that it's a black pole warbler. Ignoring the legs for now, if you describe the other field marks this bird has, well, it's got light markings on its breast. It's got a broken eye ring. It's got a thick, no, not really a thick, but a dark eye line. It's got some white wing bars. It's got white under the tail. That's some, those are some field marks that you can use to distinguish it from, say, an orange crowned warbler that superficially looks quite similar. They're both yellowish, smallish birds. They both have a broken eye ring. They both have black through the eye. They both have some white on their wings. But an experienced birder will be able to tell you that those are definitely different because of the combination of the field marks that you can see. One thing you do need to be aware of is that birds have a great variety of, they have great variety even within a species. You can imagine how difficult it would be if an alien species were writing a field guide to mammals on earth and had to use one half page to describe human beings and they could only use two or three images. Well, Human beings range from very, very light skinned to very, very dark skinned. Some are very short, some are really tall, some are narrow, some are wide. It's hard to describe what species look like in a very short amount of space. And the same applies for birds. And we haven't even considered the different genetic conditions that individual birds can have. I wanted to show you some examples of the individual variety that you can encounter. This Canada goose, for example, has an unusually colored head and face. This is a morning dove from a few weeks ago that has a little bit too much white on its back. You'll often encounter birds like chickadees that have their head or body has too much white. This black capped chickadee photo was actually taken, I believe, the same day as this blue jay photo. It looks like this blue jay is encountering some unusual shadows, but it's not. That's actually the, the coloration in its head. And then sometimes you encounter birds that are completely unlike what they'd ever appear in a field guide, like this robin that just doesn't have the proper coloration at all. You can also find some variety in this variety, of course, is applicable to any species. This mockingbird has something going on with extra stuff growing out of its foot. This red pole is, quote, incorrectly colored. Uh, this past summer, when I was in near Val d'Or, Quebec, I came upon this Cape May warbler, which doesn't look at all like a Cape May warbler is supposed to look like. It's supposed, quote, supposed to look like this, according to field guides. And then, undoubtedly, the most famous bird like this that I've encountered is this this bird that turns out to be a dick sissel, which is supposed to look like this, but the one that I encountered is missing the yellow, it's missing the black, it's missing the chestnut wing patch. It really doesn't look like the normal dick sissel at all. All of those are possible when you're out in the field. And that's one of the joys of birding is that you really never know what it is that you're gonna encounter. And that was really a whirlwind tour of getting used to being a bird watcher. I wanna sort of pivot now to talk about some tips when, if you're interested in photographing birds. The first tip 
is that I think it's important that you are a bird watcher first. What I mean by that is that you should watch the birds, get familiar with what they're doing. That will help you take better photos. You'll understand when they're likely to turn around, when they're likely to fly away, when they're likely to move the, the way you want them to move based on where the light is. And sometimes if your photography is getting frustrating, it's good to just pretend you don't even have a camera and just enjoy watching the birds. And that's what I think we're all hoping to do is just have a good time out in nature. You also need to be realistic. I certainly wasn't realistic when I started photographing birds. I went, went out with my first camera and my first lens and thought, here we go. I'm going to get 10, 10 warbler pictures that are going to be magazine worthy today. And it quickly became apparent that that, that, is, that is rarely the case. And I just wanted to show you some examples of images that I've taken that are really quite terrible. And this is the types of types of terribleness that you can encounter as a bird photographer. This is not a cropped image. This is an image that I took of a broadwing hawk. I don't know how I managed to completely leave out the bird's head, but that is what I did. So you sometimes will get a sharp image that doesn't include what you actually wanted to include. Other times you'll encounter a bird that is just not in a situation to be photographed well. I was very happy to encounter this gull a few weeks ago at the sewage lagoons in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. Shout out to the Rocky Mountain House sewage lagoons. It's a great place for birding. But when I first saw this gull, I did not know that it was going to turn out to be this rare type of gull. But I got this photo. I'm quite happy to have this photo to prove that I saw what I claim that I saw. It, it definitely identifies this photo as a Sabine skull. But to photograph it, I had to shoot through a chain link fence in poor lighting of a bird that's pretty far away. I couldn't use autofocus because the, the fence was, di was disrupting the autofocus. So I'm manually focusing on a bird that's flying around far away in bad light. It really doesn't matter what kind of hardware that you have. That's just simply not going to result in a sharp, great photo. So then be realistic about what you're going to be able to accomplish. You'll also end up with, with lots of images like this one which definitely it shows that there are pine siskins in this tree, but there's not really any other redeeming qualities of this photo. There's, it's incredibly busy. Uh, the neither bird is clearly shown. There's stuff in the way. Uh, yeah, you'll end up with lots of images like this that you'll want to just delete. Recently, I went out attempting to get pictures of chimney swifts in flight. And they're a very fast moving bird. I just wanted to photograph one in my home county of Hastings. And this is the type of image that I got. Not very good. But I didn't want to spend, if I spent all day there, I probably could have had a bit of a better image. But these are fast moving birds that I was shooting directly above my head, again, with not the greatest light. And be realistic that you're just not going to get awesome images in, in situations like that, unless you've practiced a lot and you're willing to put in the effort. And that day I wasn't. And so this is what I came home with instead. In terms of specific tips, I think the most important one with any animal photography is that you want to be shooting toward your shadow, ideally. You want the sun behind you. And you want to get at eye level with your subject. In the case of birds that are on the ground, that means you want to be as close to the ground as possible, which comes with trade-offs. You're more likely to get dirty. You're, you're more likely to damage your equipment. And like everything in photography, it's all a trade-off in terms of what type of image do you want to get and how much effort are you willing to put into getting that image. And let me give you a specific example of a bird that I encountered not that long ago. It was the first time I've ever found a Dunlin in Quebec. 
I haven't done that much birding in Quebec, but there are a lot of eBird regions in Quebec for me to get up to my previously mentioned goal. So I'll be returning there a lot in the years to come. I'll probably have to make, I don't know, many dozens of birding trips to Quebec in the next couple of decades. And I'm looking forward to all of them. Anyway, I found this Dunlin. And as you can see with this image, the bird's shadow is at the bottom of the image. In other words, this picture was taken while shooting directly into the sunlight. Not ideal at all. I corrected this image a bit in Lightroom. I could probably spend time and correct it more. But recognize that when you're in the field and you encounter this, the best thing to do is to move around so that the sun is behind you. In the case of this Dunlin, it wasn't part of a flock. It was all by itself. So instead of, obviously, I can't tell it to move. It's not a human subject. I can't ask it to walk over here. It's up to me to change the situation. So I take a very wide path and walk all the way around the beach, you know, all the way around it and come back out. So I'm, I'm on the other side of it. My goal is to not disrupt the bird at all. I come around behind it as I was doing that. I was taking some other images so you can see what it looks like. This is side lighting. You can see the shadow of the bird in this case is on the, on the left side of the image. Still not really what I was looking for, but as I moved around and eventually got the sunlight behind me, then you can end up with a better image. This is more what I was looking for, and it's easier to fix in Lightroom. And then you end up with what I would say is my best image of the series where you can't even see the shadow. I think as I was moving around, not only did I put the sun behind me, I also got lucky in that the sun went behind clouds. I guess that's another thing to mention. Cloudy days are far better for nature photography than sunny days. You want the cloud to, the cloud is like a big natural um, filter of the light that makes the light look a little bit better. Another important tip for bird photography and nature photography in general, there's a lot of standing around and there's a lot of waiting. And sometimes it can try your patience. I'm definitely working on that. I like to sometimes find my spot and wait for the birds to come to me. Now that you can definitely take that too far. I don't, don't encourage you to walk out into the woods and just stand around and say, I'm going to stand here until an owl perches on this tree beside me. You might be there a while. But in this case, this Blackburnian warbler photograph I got because I was, first of all, I was at a location that had lots of warblers. You've got to investigate where you want to go to do that. This is Prince Edward Point National Wildlife Area, one of my, probably my favorite place on earth. This particular image was taken because there were enough warblers around that I could wait for one to come to this exact perch. So I'm not shooting up at this tree and then this tree and then walking over here and shooting here. I'm literally just standing still waiting for a bird to come to this part of this tree. A lot of the time that results in nothing, but I identify, identify that this tree is in the right, the light that I want. And I'm hoping that something comes in. Now, I wish this bird, no offense to this bird, but I wish this was a male Blackburnian warbler that had has a brighter orange throat. I wish more of the bird was in front, like was not quite as obscured, but just an example of how patience can result in an image that you can be proud of. I've also um, really discovered while birding that you want to be honest with yourself about the types of places you like to go. And for me, I'm looking for a location that has a huge variety of birds that are close to me and unobscured so that I can get good pictures of them. And ideally I'm there completely by myself. And as I mentioned with the trade-offs when it comes to photography, every location you go to, I'm sacrificing one of these criteria. I can find places that have a great variety of birds, but there are also far too many people there for my liking. So I have to choose, do I go there or do I go to a place where I'm guaranteed not to run into any other people, but there are far fewer birds? It's 
depending on how I feel on any particular day or week or hour, I'll alter my, my schedule accordingly. I just wanted to give you an example of the types of locations that can result in, in some good bird photos. The best bird location I've ever seen in my entire life is at the sewage lagoons of Arrowland, Ontario. I don't feel like I'm revealing anything special. Arrowland is not close to most of you. It's about 85 kilometers north of Geraldton in Northern Ontario. When I was there, it was a spectacular uh, place for birds. This image has in it, there are probably 10 species of birds in this image. You can't see them because it's a wide angle, but there were gulls flying around, all kinds of sparrows and warblers. Uh, I think a bald eagle came through, there were hawks, there was a vulture, shorebirds, you name it, those birds were near this location. And even after I'd gotten up, because I crouched down to get as low as possible, and I got up to rest my knees, only then did I realize that right down below me was a short-billed dowager and a flock. And you can see how well camouflaged they are given where they where they're standing. Another example of a location that has some trade-offs. I'd only been here once. This is some place I visited about a month ago near Stetler, Alberta. This is a slough that occurs at the end of a dead end road. Always a good indication for a, a place I'd like to, to check out. You can see you definitely have a trade-off in terms of proximity. There's lots of birds out here. The, there's the shorebirds in the foreground, there's the shorebirds in the, on the right-hand side of the image, and then there are the shorebirds at the back that are unfortunately only identifiable if you have a scope. Um, but again, at this location, it turns out that the, the shorebirds at the front were mostly, were mostly dowagers. Another place like that in Alberta was Weed Lake, which has this expansive mud flat. And I was there for two hours one morning and didn't encounter another soul, perfect. This place was almost perfect with all three of the criteria. There were stilts and avocets and other shorebirds and ducks. And the lighting would happen to be great when I was there. So I was able to, to try the images of stilts that have this, this reflection, which you, which, you can't, which you could probably manipulate in Lightroom, but I want to get in the field. And the other part about being patient is that sometimes things will just show up that you were absolutely not expecting. And in this case, while I was taking a break from photographing the shorebirds, this unusual sparrow, at least unusual for me, that I, I don't see it very frequently, a Nelson sparrow just popped up and was within five feet of where I'd set up my tripod. Perfect example of how you just never know when you're out birding. I think it's also important that you, whatever camera you have, and these days it's really not that important what camera you have, but what's important is how well you know how to manipulate the camera. The camera should just become an extension of your hand, and you've got to know how to do certain things quickly, ideally with your eyes closed. It's a good exercise to pretend that you encountered something and put a blindfold on and see if you can see if you can change the settings of your camera. At, at the very least, you want to be able to change the shutter speed, the aperture, or the exposure compensation without taking your eye off the bird that you're trying to photograph. In my particular case, I have my camera set up with back button autofocus. And it's just become muscle memory for me that this is focus with my thumb, this is shutter with my finger, and then I know how to do exposure compensation. I hold that down and I do that dial. Shutter speed's down here, aperture's up here. It just becomes second nature that you know how to do those things. The other setting I have that I think is important is to use auto ISO mode. It's it can be scary to use the manual mode. I shoot photograph with Canon cameras, so I know that they call that the M mode because it sounds like you're in control of too much. But with auto ISO, the camera will take care of the ISO, which is the least important now given all the technology around noise reduction. 
And then if I want to change my shutter speed or aperture, the camera will adjust the ISO for me to ensure a proper exposure of the image. When I go out and I'm on a day that has enough light, I tend to have my camera set at one two thousandth of a second at f8. But then I need to know that if I'm in, if I let's say I walk into a forest where there's much less light because almost everything's shaded, I'll have to reduce the, the shutter speed from one two thousandth, maybe down to one one thousandth, and reduce the aperture from f8 to f5.6. You, you get a sense of what settings to use in different situations. For example, when I encountered this snowy owl, it was very dark. And therefore, I had to set the shutter speed to what is probably the lowest I would ever use on a bird, one five hundredth of a second. I almost always am hand holding my camera and I have a, an effective 600 millimeter lens on. So I can't really avoid camera shake if I'm shooting at one eight hundredth or lower. But in this case, I had to go down to one five hundred to let enough light in to illuminate the owl. And I set the aperture to the lowest possible level, again, to let in as much light as possible. Compare that to if you encounter a bird that's very fast moving, they don't come much faster moving than hummingbirds. You want to, sh to put your shutter speed at the absolute fastest possible that you can. Now, in this case, you might go to one four thousandth of a second, or depending on your camera model, and if there's enough light, one eight thousandth of a second. But you need to think about the subject that you're shooting and the lighting conditions on that subject. I'll finish off with what is undoubtedly the most important tip, both for bird watching and for photography, and that is to practice all the time all the time and realize that this is a lifelong learning adventure. I love, I learn something new about nature every, all, every time I go out. I post something to iNaturalist, I identify it as some sort of fungus and then somebody tells me, no, that's not the right type of fungus, that's actually this kind of fungus and then I Wikipedia them and, and learn that. It's fun, you wanna get out there and learn and take lots of pictures and recognize that most of them are gonna be trash that, that you want to delete, uh, but then there are some that you're gonna be proud of and that you wanna keep. So I'll just finish off with a couple of my favorite bird images from around the country. This is a willow ptarmigan from Yellowknife. I got to go there for work a couple winters ago. Not a lot of variety of birds, but the ones that you do see are uh, pretty cool, like this willow charming. You, you can just see how awesome its feet look, uh, how it's got these built-in snowshoes. And then closer to home in the winter, you get birds like, I'm always trying to find snow buntings, horned larks, Lapland longspurs, things like that, that are in around the, the fields. And I just like this image because of the, it shows you how well camouflaged this bird is on this fence post. And then the highlight of any birding trip, at least in the, the spring for me, is to find warblers. And one of my favorite kinds of warblers is the golden winged warbler, always hoping to encounter one. And this was a couple years ago, I think, in Prince Edward County. So that really wraps up what I think was a whirlwind tour of how to become a birder and some tips on how to photograph birds. Uh, if we have have time, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thanks, Kyle. That was great. Um, I've, I've learned a whole lot there and it was uh, a lot of good information and, and a good, uh, good overview of some of those tips of uh, things I think a lot of people, a lot of us who don't photograph birds don't often think about. So I think that was that was super helpful. Um, some people had some kind of specific kind of technical like focal length and um, exposure compensation. Um, if there's not time to get up to all these questions, maybe we can um, kind of write a few of those in and we'll send them around to participants and just kind of have that all kind of written up because as much as we mention it here, it's it's kind of easy to forget numbers and that kind of stuff goes over some people's heads. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I, li I like this first one though, that you talk a lot about the, the time you spend out um, 
photographing birds. Um, how do you balance that with um, work, <laughs> with being able to get out <laughs> birds and, and still being able to, to make a living? Uh, well, good question. So I've made the decision. First of all, I have a fantastic employer uh, that lets me take. Um, I've made a decision that what's very important for me in my compensation is time off. And my employer is willing to have me take 10, 12 weeks off a year. And so that I'm only paid for the time that I'm working. So I've made the decision in my life that I don't care as much about making the most absolute money that I can. And I'd rather be out shooting birds. So it, in some ways, it comes down to just a life decision that that's a choice that I've made. I recognize how fortunate I am to be able to make that decision and not everyone can, can make that choice. I did make the decision as well to take the first role I had with Shad was a role that, quote, forced me to travel across the country. And I first came upon this goal of seeing 50 birds in every region when I realized I've been to every region of Canada for work pretty much. And maybe now I should on my own time, go back and fill in some of the holes. So I made the choice to choose a role that allowed me to travel for work as well as an employer that let me travel on my own time. And then I find um, I prefer to do the, the ideal for me is a road trip. And I worked uh, for about seven or eight years in a row, I worked in Vancouver in July. And to get there from Ontario each year in June, I would drive. So I'd take four weeks between Ontario and Vancouver. And then August, when I was done, I'd spend time to drive back. Obviously, it would have been faster and cheaper to fly home. But I made the decision that I'd rather hit some eBird hotspots on the way and look for birds in provinces that I never wouldn't, wouldn't, would get to see otherwise. No, that's great. Um, and obviously the, the, the principles and the tips work for anybody, regardless of, you know, where they are and how much time they can take off. So those of us that are working from home and seeing birds in our backyard or feeders or city streets, you know, these same, same principles will still, still work out. Yeah. I think an, I had a great example yesterday. I make sure I bird every day. Sometimes that means I'm just standing on my deck for five minutes. Like I, I I'm not, I'd, I'd always rather be out birding likely, but sometimes I do work. And yesterday I just took five minutes and a peregrine falcon flew by and I've never seen one from my deck. And just as soon as I stepped outside within 10 seconds, I'd seen a peregrine falcon fly by. So yeah, you, even if you just have five minutes in a city, you can see some extraordinary things. Yeah, that's great. Um, a good question here about for new birders, especially, and, and I experience this a lot, is we, we hear birds often, but we don't see them. So do you have tips on where to start with, with that? I think the Merlin Bird ID app is a great place to start. You can hold it up and your phone's microphone will listen to the sounds and tell you what you're seeing. And that's a good starting point. And then you'll maybe occasionally get a glimpse of those birds and get, get used to what they, they look like with a brief glimpse as opposed to what you'll see in a bird book or a photograph, which is a much different encounter with the bird. Uh, you wanna start pishing, which is a technique where you can try to attract some birds to you and, and make bird-like sounds that will uh, maybe make the birds come closer. You don't wanna do that excessively because it can, can, can harm the birds. But if you're at a place where you can only hear birds, sometimes being patient and just being still and backing off, but still sort of keeping an eye on where you heard them is a good technique. They might then come out, especially if you walk into a place that has feeders and that scares all the birds away. Just go back around the corner. And if you wait a while, the birds were eating there before, they'll, they'll probably come back and eat there again. Same thing if you encounter shorebirds and they're on the shore and a, a peregrine falcon comes through and, and makes them all fly away. Sometimes you feel the urge to go chase the shorebirds. But if you just sit there and wait, they might come back to the exact same place that they just were. 
Uh, yeah, and I'd, I'd add too that for uh, those of those of us that are using iNaturalist, iNaturalist allows for the upload of sound recordings as well. Um, so it doesn't ID them the way Merlin does, but it um, you can upload them, and then people on iNaturalist can listen to those recordings and and help confirm that that yeah, species. Yeah, and I've as been well. using that feature as well. I've I've become quite interested in the fact, just like the images of the birds, you can find birds that are making sounds that. You know, you can tell what bird it is because you can see the bird, but the field guide only describes two or three sounds it makes, but you might have encounter it making an entirely different sound. Um, yeah, totally. Um, another question when you're talking about the sun, and I find this for this is a factor for all observations is that, you know, when trying to get around so that the sun is behind you, um, you might get your own shadow in the photo. How do you avoid and manage that so you're not shading your own observation or your own photo? Yeah, I there's not much you can do about that, but you just have to be mindful of where your shadow is. And it's a, I guess, a good example of <laughs> your be being realistic about your expectations. If you're there and you're shooting a bird, no matter where the light is, if there are strong shadows, it's going to be hard to get a five star image. And so that time you might only get a four star image and then note where you were and return there next day, next month, next year, next decade, and maybe you'll get a better image. Um, great. Um, and there's a bit of few questions about gear, but I wonder if maybe that's something we could send around to folks. Um, I know you mentioned yeah. you might have an extra. Yeah, I do have this slide for... that I, I assumed there'd be at least one or two questions about my gear. This is the gear. Uh, I haven't gotten into the mirrorless bodies. I expect, especially given that Canon isn't really investing in in new DSLRs, that I will eventually have a Canon body that's mirrorless. But for now, I use my trusty 7D Mark II with a 300 millimeter lens with a two times extender. I say that I have the two time extender so that I can have a bit more flexibility and sometimes shoot at 600 and sometimes shoot at 300. But the reality is that the extender has not been removed from that 300 for well over a year. And when I travel, it stays on. When I So really what I'm doing is I'm shooting with a 600 millimeter 5.6. Great. Um, there is another question as well about climate change um, and potentially new new visitors to Canada. Are you like in your, your world? Are you, are you hearing more about that? Is that... Well, there's a challenge. Is that maybe exciting? <laughs> I well, I guess that's one of the one of the minor quote benefits of climate change <laughs> yeah. is that we're getting birds that are pushed up north that you might not see. That applies to mammals. I've seen road killed opossums, for example. I've actually had an opossum show up on my uh, security camera in my backyard. I've never actually seen a live one in Ontario yet, but. It's the same for birds. We're seeing birds like great egret that are coming north. Um, there was a Chuck Wills widow that was in Prince Edward County for years. It, that species might start showing up. Black vultures are coming. So yeah, there are definite, we're definitely seeing the impact of um, the birds that are coming north. And of course, the unfortunate part is that if they, there's only so far north they can go before there's no trees and not any place for them to be. Mm. Thank, great, thanks. Um, and I think maybe a good one to end with would be, um, there's a couple tied into this talking about um, ways to take the photo that might bother the, the subject less if the autofocus sometimes maybe for insects that that, that, that pre-flash kind of bothers them and they scurry away. But similarly with birding, I know there can be people that flock <laughs> to an area and um, have over love a species to death kind of thing. Uh, do you have any tips or ideas for like kind of ethical birding and what, basically ways to make sure that we're having minimal impact on the on the species in the in the area? Yeah, that's a tough one because I, I I recognize how much you want to photograph something, especially if you've never seen it. But I think resisting the temptation to to even go is is one of the techniques I I. I really don't like, just in general, I don't like birding beside 10 other people. So if I go to a place and there are 50 people, that's five times worse. than. <laughs> so avoid going. Um, if you do have to go, maybe go quickly, take your image and then 
Like, there's no need to try to get the absolute greatest image. You don't need to photograph the same bird that a hundred other people have photographed. You don't need to get a thousand images of it. Just get one and leave. Um, yeah, and I would say for things like owls, I think I don't think that owl sightings should be reported at all. Um, because there are just too many occurrences of them being killed based on reckless human behavior. And similarly, eBird and iNaturalist both um, hide some of those true locations, right? So it doesn't encourage people when, you know, a certain species like owl or, or charismatic thing is observed, it doesn't flag a whole bunch of people that then go and, and check it out. So there's a little bit of safety built into some of those certain species. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now that was amazing. We've got lots of uh, um, comments in the Q and A and the chat to say thanks, and they uh, everybody found this super helpful and uh, very entertaining. Well, well spoken, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'd like to thank you very much, and on behalf of everybody, and uh, keep an eye out, everyone, for some of the extra answers to questions that we'll uh, we'll work to um, provide some answers and send around along with the, when the recording is available. Okay, my pleasure. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everyone, for your time and, and um, being thoroughly engaged. Have a great end of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.